In this video, I'm going to show you how you can speed up game development using custom tools. Believe it or not, this is a solution to a problem that I've been having, but we'll get onto that later. I've been making a difficult platforming game called Faceplant for over a year and a half now. It's my first solo developed game, and on this journey, I've learned some ways to make the process more efficient. So I'm going to show you four ways I've done that with my full process for how I create a tool as well. I'm using the Godot engine, but this should be transferable to whatever engine you use. And as a disclaimer, I'm no expert, and these tools might not be directly related to the type of game you're making, but hopefully you can learn something and maybe it can inspire you to make your process more efficient. If you have any tips or if you've made any interesting tools for your game, please let us know in the comments. You might just help someone out. This is rules for tools, otherwise known as common sense, which I sometimes have to remind myself of because uh, I am the biggest tool. So number one is it has to save time. You don't want to spend more time working on tools than you do on actual development. Number two, good enough is good enough. One problem usually has multiple solutions and there is no real perfect solution. So good enough is generally good enough. And number three, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Making tools is fun, right? But not everything needs to be optimized. So following these, let's take a look at some things I've done. So here's the problem. My game is huge. This tile map is in one scene and it holds all of my levels. These white blocks here represent the platforms. At some point, I'm gonna to wanna to put some artwork there, like this little placeholder here. So how can I get this level layout into an art editor so I can draw on top of it? The first thing I thought of was maybe I could screenshot each level and then just put it into the art editor manually. But with 56 screens planned, uh, that's going to take a lot of work. If I screenshot it manually, how can I make sure the window size is the same size as the background art? And how can I make sure I'm getting it lined up perfectly per screen? Doing it manually is just not an option. Fortunately, in Godot, there's a way to save the screen as a texture, like a PNG image. And then I just had to set up some automation so that I can go through each level step by step. So if I'm in the game and I press my screenshot button to change the window size to the actual pixel resolution that I'm going to be using for the background art, and it's scrolling through every single level in my game and exporting them as textures into a folder. It even automatically hides everything that I don't need in the screenshot, all conveniently named as well. So all I need to do now is open that folder drag those images into my art editor and I have the templates for the levels ready to go. By the way, you can wishlist Faceplant now on Steam. I believe Steam shows the most wishlisted upcoming games in the popular upcoming section. So it's a free and simple way to support if you want. I'd really appreciate it. Sometimes it's useful to have some information on screen when you're playing the game. So one of the first tools that I ever made was this little debug window, as you can see here. At its most basic, this is just a display that works at runtime, which gives me some information that might be useful, like can the character jump? What's the Y velocity? What's the gravity scale? What's the current FPS? Can the character double jump? And all those things. So if I just play the game, I made a little button that toggles on and off the debug. Some of these I haven't used in a long time, so they don't work anymore. I also added in some toggle buttons like wall bouncing when i was testing wall bouncing it was useful to turn it on and off fire mode um, it's no longer in the actual game but if you touch the fire you die and you basically have to start again i've got a little timer toggle here for speed runs when you start playing the game i can easily track how long each section takes and obviously i can have this little toggle for horizontal movement which i later mapped to a keybind but the coolest thing i think is this little line edit tool here. As you can see, it says type a number to teleport. So one problem that I had pretty quickly with this game was how do I test out the levels individually without having to get back to that level? Usually if the levels are scene based, you could just open that scene. But since my level is in one huge scene, as I showed before, I needed some sort of system to test the levels individually. So in order to solve that, I basically came up with these level targets. As you can see here, just above my head, I placed them in the game where I want to test from certain areas like level one, level two, level three. If I play the game and I type in a number into this little box, like let's say we want to go to level five, press enter, it will teleport the player to level five. And then I can turn horizontal movement on and test it again. This is really useful, obviously, because I can go as far as high as I want and test out any level basically 
immediately. When I first set the system up, I would manually have to assign each of these levels a position in the script. But the way I set it up now uses some of the tips from earlier from automation. Let's say we're at the current level target, level 60, and I wanna add a level target here. All I need to do is duplicate the level 61, put it in place, play the game, type in 61, and it's taken us to the level. That is all automated. And the way that it works is, basically we have this level targets group here, which is where all of the level targets are stored. Each of these nodes has a position. I can change the position of 60, for example, and it's updating the position in the transform. When I play the game and type in 60, it says, okay, which is the 60th child in this group? And what is its position? Let's teleport the player to that position. And it's as simple as that. A very useful tool that has saved me so much time. So obviously when you're debugging your game, you can use the in-game debugger here and set breakpoints in your script so you know exactly when the code's breaking and you can figure things out a little bit easier with your code. But one thing that I find really useful is to have some actual visual debugging functions as well. Small but simple things like turning the character green on jump, changing the player's direction when I want to, checking if the player's on the floor by either turning the player green, turning the player red or turning them blue. These visual indicators just help me identify when something's happening when I play the game. So I'll show you the effectiveness of these visual debuggers. So recently I've been working on the springs, which is one of the mechanics in the game, and I wanted to know when visually certain momentums for the spring activated. So I can put the game in slow motion, as I've done here, and then play the game and you'll see the character's blue, but turns green and red. And the green indicates that it's the second level of spring momentum, and the red indicates that it's at the highest level of spring momentum. And it works exactly as I like. There we go. So to show another use case for this, I'll show you the ghost sprite. So when I jump in the air, a sprite will appear at the position that the character was at. Now, <laughs> the sprite is Lumber because I implemented this when we had Lumber in the game and not the new plant character, also uh, Rip, Rip Lumber, but it does work as intended. This gives me a visual indication so I can see what's the character in the collision box when I press the jump button and so it should activate. So all I'd need to do is update the sprite, but I mean, maybe this is just the ghost of Lumber coming back to help us. Not that Lumber's dead. The cool thing is, if I have a bunch of these on screen, I can easily clear them with a hotkey as well. And if I merge this with my slow motion, I can get an even better idea of what's happening. Sometimes thinking in code makes my brain hurt, but being able to see something helps me understand it a lot better. So for all the tools that I've shown you so far, like the debug menu and the visual tools, I feel like some of these things work best when you have custom keybinds. If I teleport to an area and the, and the player is just constantly moving, it can be very difficult to control what's going on. So, like I said, I have this button to stop the horizontal movement, but I link that up with a keybind. That goes for a bunch of different things in the game. I have keybinds to start and stop the movement, if I fall down and want to retest that area, I can simply press T and I go back to the start of that area. And that changes depending on the area that I'm at. So let's go to like 51, for example. I go there, if I lose progress, press T, I'm back to that area. That's all automatically set up. I can change the player's direction if I need to. That's just to help me test certain areas. Obviously, you won't be able to do that in the game because the character is always moving. I can even speed up and slow down time. I don't know when I'd need to speed up, but it's kind of funny. These are just very useful little things that I can do to make the development process, the level testing specifically, way, way easier. But that's not all because you can also have custom keybinds for the editor. Let me show you a big problem that I had. So when I'm designing levels, I frequently switch between the objects that I'm selecting and needing to place tiles on the tile map. Now, in order to do that, I can click on the objects if I'm in the object mode, but to find the tile map, I have to go all the way to this little hierarchy thing, scroll all the way up, maybe past my level targets, where's my, find where my levels is, there's my levels, there's my tile map, and there you go. I can now start placing levels. But now, if I wanna go back to moving the object, I have to click on something else, click the object, and then I can move the object. And that just isn't very efficient at all. If I'm doing that constantly when designing one screen, I'm gonna be wasting so much time just on clicking objects and the tile map and 
it's a nightmare. One cool thing that I found out about were tool scripts. So basically, if you have a script which has the keyword tool at the top, it will run not just at runtime, but in the engine. So like right now, when I'm just making the game. So one very simple thing that I made using this tool script was a custom keybind, where I can press F9 to go to my tile map and place tiles, and F10 to select objects and move them around, and F11 to select the last known level target so that I can easily duplicate that and create a new level target that I can teleport to at any time. Very, very simple to set up. Tool scripts are super powerful. But how do you put that all together to make a tool? Well, let me show you with this problem. In my game, we have variable jumping, right? We have short jumps, long jumps, and how do I know where I can place the next platform when doing the level design? Well, when I first started making the game, I would literally just memorize the blocks up and along that I could go. And I also had this little jump ruler that I could use and memorize the values and just move around the map <laughs> and see how far the next platform could be. But things have gotten way more complicated since then because now we have way more mechanics. We have these conveyors which speed up and slow down the character and the result of that is when you're going fast your jump arc is lengthened and when you're going slow your jump arc is reduced and springs which obviously yeet you through the air giving you a much higher jump arc. So basically when I'm designing these levels I have to place a platform in an area where I think you may be able to jump to, open up the game, teleport to the area and then test out the jump if I can make it and all of that takes way too much time. So because of all these variables, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to be able to click on any part of the map in the editor while I'm doing the level design and I want to see the jump trajectory of the character. So let's see if I can figure that out. First thing I do when making a tool is write down the functionality I want to achieve in a notebook or most likely in paint. So in this case, when I click the screen, I want to see the jump arcs of my character to determine where to place a platform. I would need all the trajectory lines for the various jumps available, like long jumps, conveyor jumps and spring jumps. So then I'll research some possible solutions. I discovered that the way to draw a line in Godot was with the draw function. This takes in an array of points and then draws them to the screen. But how do I get the points? I first explored the math side of this, you know, how to get the arc of a jump, parabolas, trajectory formulas, equations of motions, uh, but because my code is spaghetti and my brain is smooth, I think it's just going to hurt my head if I try and figure it out. So I had another idea, which is a bit easier. It's kind of hacky, but it's going to be faster for me to implement. And remember, good enough is good enough. So essentially, I'll write a little script that when the player is in the air, it'll record the coordinates of the player's position on a time interval. And once you land, it will print out these coordinates to the console. And then I can take that array of coordinates and plug it into the draw function to display the line. So write the script, jump in game, get the coordinates from the printout, plug that into my draw function, which is on a tool script, so it works in the editor, and boom, the jump trajectory line displays in the editor. I started experimenting with how it should look since you can change the thickness of the line and I realized that it would be helpful to display two versions on top of each other. This thick kind of deformed pineapple ring would actually be super useful. So I can show one thin trajectory line, one thicker trajectory line, which is the same width as the player's collision box. And the thick line will mean I can see where the player might collide and bounce back or be able to make the jump. It would also be nice to have the player sprite in the starting position that I can use for reference when placing around the map. Before I changed the style, I got it moving on mouse click and hold. Right now it's offset from the mouse position because the coordinates were recorded locally in the game, so I'll have to translate the points to the zero position before I set them to the mouse position. I got the character sprite at the mouse position, tried to add the reflected line uh, with some problems, but I fixed that and styled it and made it snap to pixels so it's easier to place. Now you can see how useful the thicker trajectory line is in determining jump placement. And it actually works a lot better than I expected. I can place platforms and I know for a fact the character can make the jump and I can analyze level design to see if anything needs tweaking. I did the same for the conveyor jumps and spring jumps and now I have this. I can place my character anywhere in the game and use a hotkey to switch between jump arcs. I can design levels without needing to test as much in game. There we go. Let me know what you think in the comments and make sure you join the Discord community so you can share your games or art or whatever you make and stay up to date with how things are going. In my next devlog, I should be very close to finishing the level design. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that. And maybe check out another one of my devlogs while you wait. Thanks for watching.